Okay. So uh, we are delighted to have her here today to um, talk about decolonizing Ukrainian culture, the role of art institutions in a time of war. Um, so we'll have an hour for the event and uh, look forward to discussion afterwards. So you can um, enter questions and comments online uh, via the chat and uh, I'll moderate a discussion afterwards, but let's turn things over to uh, Svetlana. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Henry. Thank you for, for inviting me. And uh, for me, it's a great, great pleasure to present today and to talk about um, a part of my kind of larger project uh, uh, that focuses on uh, explorations of decoloniality in Ukrainian culture and the ways to decolonize Ukrainian culture. And, uh, I address this important topic as an art historian and uh, uh, large part of my research focuses on uh, exploring directly uh, works of art by uh, by Ukrainian artists but to, in today's presentation I would like to uh, focus on a quite a different topic and that is the role of art institutions in Ukraine in uh, the process of uh, on this in this process of change of uh, narrative uh, that uh, that is present now in in, in Ukrainian culture, and uh, also I want to talk about the cultural impact of the war on uh, individual artistic practices and on uh, art institutions in in Ukraine. So, uh, in this presentation, uh, I will examine how the war affected uh, the institutional development in the Ukrainian cultural sector and how cultural resistance to the war effects foster decolonization processes in Ukraine on all institutional levels, from private grassroots initiatives and non-profits to state-funded public institutions. My premise is that Ukraine entered the active phase of decolonial processes with the outbreak of the full-scale invasion on 24 February 2022, following eight years of partial occupation of Ukrainian territories by Russia and resulting tensions of the hybrid war. The period up to 2022 can be characterized in terms of postcolonial hybridity and ambivalence, which as proposed by a postcolonial scholar, Homi Baba, occur when the oppressor and the oppressed regard one another within an ambiguous perspective, in the context of hybridity when the once dominant culture infects its former colonial domain, domain with its own identity. The decolonial attempts to challenge the situation began with the Euromaidan protests in 2014, uh, in 2013 and 2014. However, they reached their culmination with the outset of the anti-colonial struggle against the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Here I propose, uh, and in every my uh, in every my text and every my talk, I kind of follow this um, uh, this, uh, this, this, this 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 idea that uh, the notions of uh, the post-colonial and the decolonial are not interchangeable. While the notion of the post-colonial denotes a situation immediately following the colonial experience, taking on all the implications of colonialism to reinterpret them, the notion of the decolonial speaks about the final process of dismantling the colonial narrative. The colonial scholar Madina Tlastana re remarks on the chronological and logical discrepancies between the two approaches. The post-colonial condition is uh, more of an objective given, she says a geopolitical and geohistorical situation of uh, many people coming from former colonies. The, the colonial stance is one step further as it involves a conscious choice of how to interpret reality and how to act upon it. So I propose that uh, the atrocities of the Russian war of aggression have brought Ukraine to its decolonial stage and the once dominating narrative of Russian culture enveloping Ukrainian culture collapsed irreversibly. And this was reflected uh, respectively in artistic production and the work of institutions uh, within the cultural sector, as I will show further in uh, my presentation. The situation with the Russian war on Ukraine plunged Ukraine in an anti-colonial struggle and caused what they call rapid decolonization as the key to survival in a time of war. This process can be contrasted with slow decolonization, which occurs in a situation not as urgent as, and demanding as uh, the ongoing war of aggression and largely relies on the post-colonial recombination of uh, one's dominant narratives. Therefore, Ukraine's decolonization, often criticized as radical, is uh, a necessary means to endurance, or simply existence, and is rooted in the efforts towards sustainable development in unfavorable conditions, extremely unfavorable conditions, as we can see with uh, the current ongoing uh, situation. 
Uh, as the colonial theorists Walter Mignolo and Marina Tlostanova propose, the coloniality is firstly an epistemological project rooted in the ability of the oppressed society to create new narratives that would reflect through uh, that would reflect thinking beyond the former colonial domain. The disentanglement of Ukrainian culture therefore relies on the capacity of such production, supported by individual efforts and consolidated initiatives. This process is largely conditioned by the solidarity principle and the principle of participatory democracy as applied to the cultural sector. Institutional transformation in the Ukrainian wartime case is the key to decolonization because it rearranges the system affected by the aggression at times uh, in uh, the most direct uh, ways of physical destruction uh, in order to find more effective ways for the reconsideration of historically contested narratives and, establish, uh, and establishing a new epistemological basis through cultural production. So at, having this in mind, I will look at the roles of arts organizations in Ukraine uh, in, in, in the decolonization processes from three perspectives. First, I will examine uh, the role of Ukrainian organizations, particularly from the Ukrainian East and South, which were displaced or uh, since their existence due to the war before or after February 2022. I will analyze the effects of this displacement on cultural production in Ukraine. Second, I will look at Ukrainian cultural institutions which helped to relieve the burden or the impact of the war after the full-scale invasion began in February 2022. As the full-scale invasion unfolded, the cultural organizations, particularly in the west of the country, presented consolidated efforts to provide help to the artists who fled the violence and in this way supported an exchange to foster a dialogue between socially and politically engaged art practices from different regions. Uh, not only uh, socially and politically engaged, but uh, I, I have kind of a particular focus on, 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 on these practices in, 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 in this particular presentation. Third, I will explore uh, the relevant changes related to the protection of the collections and new exhibition strategies in Ukrainian public art institutions. <clears throat> Ukrainian cultural spaces, along with individual artists, produce uh, the key impact on the decolonization of culture, which is twofold. First, it consists of the dismantling of postcolonial narratives, and second, it presupposes the creation of new narratives that break from the imperial legacy of Russia. The intention of um, uh, uh, the intention of uh, the current uh, presentation is to focus on the, the recording and interpretation of the structural changes that affected the organizations from currently occupied territories and beyond, to consider selected case studies of exhibition production and curatorial strategies as methods of decolonial resistance, and finally to overcome the gap between the decolonial theory and decolonization practice. And this is something important that we observe like uh, a rupture now between the theory and practice of uh, decolonization and in particularly as applied to Ukraine's wartime situation. So to start with the, uh, so how, how can I move this? And push the space bar. Yes. Maybe it needs to wake up. You know, click on the screen first and then try to look this. Okay. So to begin with my case studies, I begin with displaced organizations and the classical case of, uh, of Izalatsa Cultural Center. The war caused destruction or displacement of many of Ukraine's cultural institutions. The key example is the case of the Izalatsa Platform for Cultural Initiatives, which was displaced for, from its original site in Donetsk to Kiev in 2014. Izalatsa was founded in 2010 as a contemporary art center on the site of a former insulation factory in Donetsk. Dedicated to integrating contemporary art practices with the local industrial context in order to revitalize local culture through international collaboration, it was the first project of its kind in Eastern Ukraine. On June 9, 2014, Izalatsia was seized by the Russia-backed militants of the self-proclaimed and recognized uh, Donetsk People's Republic. Izalatsia's offices, galleries, and art spaces were subsequently looted. The center evacuated its team, but only managed to save part of its collection closing its archive, library, and technical equipment. The site-specific installations on the territory of the cultural center were destroyed. The destroyed works included installations by international artists such as Daniel Boren, Pascal Martin Tayou, and Leandro Erle. For example, the installation Make-up piece by Pascal Martin Tayou, dedicated to the women of Donbass, was constructed on the top of uh, the tower of, of, of the plant, of the, of the smoke tower of the plant. It depicted an enormous lipstick drawing on the wordplay between making up in uh, 
uh, in cosmetics and making peace. This tower and this gendered message provoked anger of uh, the DPR militants who exploded it. Uh, the footage of, its, of this uh, explosion filmed subsequently uh, appeared uh, on social networks. Uh, but it was filmed by some anonymous user by, on his smartphone. Uh, and installations by Daniel Byrne and Leandro Ehrlich were uh, allegedly cut up and resold as scrap metal. The former site of the cultural platform uh, is now used as an illegal prison known for the particularly violent treatment of its political prisoners. In his book recently published by Harvard University Press, uh, The Torture Camp on Paradise Street, Ukrainian journalist Stanislav Asayev describes what happened further to Izolatsin in the following way. Isolation prison at 3 Paradise Street. All of us are here on premises of what formerly was an insulation factory. Now it's a military base and at the same time one of the cruelest prisons of the so-called Donetsk People Republic. This place defies a categorization. Officially it doesn't exist, unofficially it houses dozens of prisoners in various basement and cells. Given a detailed account of his own suffering as an inmate at this illegal prison camp, he defines that the main ruling force dominating his captivity was an entire spectrum of fear from mortal paralyzing dread to general overwhelming anxiety as a response to torture, witnessing crimes and numerous explicit violations of human rights. The aim of the former cultural center, which was called to foster sustainable development of the Donetsk region through cultural activity and artistic collaboration turned to the opposite with its occupation by the Russian militants. Now immersing the area into the chaos of domination through violence and the power hierarchies based on force and fear. Before the book of Asif was written, I talked about this case in the exhibition uh, La Linea del Frente, El Arte Ukrainiano 2013-2019, uh, which I presented in Mexico City and further in Canada in, in 2019. This exhibition aimed uh, to establish a dialogue uh, with the Mexican audience through the discussion of such important common topics as violence and displacement. It included works of nine Ukrainian artists and one collaboration with Estonian artist Christina Norman, and the documentation uh, of the lost works uh, from, from the Zelatsia that uh, took kind of the central, uh, central place in, uh, in, in, in this exhibition. Uh, and uh, to, to, the, to the left, the image to the left is one of the installations that was also destroyed and that was cut into, in, into, into scrap metal. Uh, okay. So, site specific installations by Ukrainian artists Maria Kulikovska and Jana Kadyrova were also among uh, the destroyed artworks. Maria Kulikovska's project, uh, Homo Bula, uh, which translates like so bubble, so bubble person or so bubble man, uh, which uh, makes this kind of work reference to Baruch Vanitas, consisted of replicas of the artist's own figure molded in soul, which reflected the fragility of the human body and questioned the agency of artists in regard to their own works. While the deeper militants occupied the territory of the cultural center, they they use the sculptures of uh, the artist's body as targets for shooting. So in 2019, in response to this event, rec replicas of the sculptures were shot by Kulikovska during a performance, when the artist carried, uh, which the artist carried out for the Ukrainian Swiss film, The Forgotten by Daria Anishinka. And the image to the, the right was supposed to represent uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, soap figures uh, shot by, uh, by, by the artist herself. Uh, Kulikovska's destruction of her own image mirrors not only the destruction of cultural objects by the occupying forces, but also the physical violence and the killings which occurred widely in the east of Ukraine after it was occupied in 2014. Kulikovska's reflection on what happened to her works represents the artist's consideration of herself being in the place of female victims of violence, as no more than another object of the atrocity. The comprehension of this bodily objectification brought about by the war and the ability to reflect on it thus reclaiming the victim's own agency is the first uh, step further toward this decolonial disentanglement. I had the chance to collaborate with the Zelatsia when uh, uh, they were forced to flee to Kiev in uh, 2014, and I witnessed the modifications the art center experienced in its management policies, cultural strategies, and themes they work with after the relocation. The new space of Zelatsia in Kiev is the site of former ship construction plant thus continuing the industrial legacy of the organization. 
Since their detachment from the mission of regional development in the east of the country, the focus of the platform turned dramatically from fostering artistic exchange to giving voice to refugees from the occupied territories and from the so-called gray zone adjacent to the front line. Uh, before, of course, that was all before 2022. The organization's project turned it into a conduit of the traumatic events in the occupied east of Ukraine for a wider national and international audience through the lens of topics of more universal importance, such as ecology, gender, and historical memory, with an underlying intention of recording and interpreting the destruction in the east of the country. For example, in the project Regrounding, the working space selected for it was the town of Solidar in the Donetsk region. Beyond its focus on seeking the connection between environmental humanities and contemporary art, such as mapping ecological emergency in a post-industrial context, it was for the first time uh, it for the first time explored the practices of memorialization of the war, looking at the landscape of the East damaged first by rootless mining, which exhausted the natural and human resources throughout the 20th century and even even um, before, and further by uh, the ongoing war. The artists who worked in the framework of this project explored in which way the complex and hybrid history of the Donetsk region transformed its landscape and its nature and how these changes can maintain the memory of human atrocity. With the outbreak of the full-scale invasion in 2022, this project relocated from Solidar, now occupied by the Russian army, to Newcastle in the United Kingdom. And uh, the, Im the missing image is uh, the image of uh, Solidar in January 2023, shelled by uh, by, 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 by the Russian army. The critical role of isolation in the Ukrainian cultural scene is in the preservation of a focus on the now occupied territories as sources of relevant cultural production and uh, sources of relevant knowledge, which is important. And in this case, it is speak about uh, decolonial processes and maintaining the memory of the war. The organization fosters an exchange of narratives reflecting on the cultural complexity and heterogeneity of the Donbass region nationally and internationally by bringing borderline epistemology to the center and placing it at the core of cultural processes. Uh, undoubtedly, such positioning uh, contributes to the aim of recentering of previously marginalized narratives. The process of decolonization, therefore, is ongoing in, in this, uh, as also uh, in other cases I will focus on, in the production of new knowledge, forming the archive of the war and uh, resistance uh, through interpretation of uh, the ongoing events. Another example of organization uh, affected by the occupation uh, is platform, platform 2 from Mariupol, an art space that was at the center of cultural resistance in the Donetsk region after 2014. Between 2014 and 2022, Mariupol's cultural renaissance was manifested in several cultural initiatives taking place concurrently in the city, at that time in close proximity of occupied territories. In 2014, Mariupol was briefly occupied by Russia, but further released by the Ukrainian army, and since became a, both a shelter for refugees for neighboring areas and a center for cultural resistance. The cultural festival Google, Google Fest, which relocated from its long-term long -term residence in Kiev to Mariupol, uh, first uh, with events in 2018 and then in 2021, was one of the first initiatives aimed at revitalization of the borderland region. The festival included a vast program of concerts, exhibitions, panel discussions, and an opera staged in a dock at Mariupol's Sportport. However ambitious the activity of Google Fest was, it came as a consequence of platform, platform two's uh, fostering of artistic exchange in Mariupol locally, and uh, the organization's activities directed at introducing the local community to contemporary visual and scenic art practices. The organization was conceived as a site that was led by displaced cultural activists from the Donetsk region in 2014. It aimed to work with the local community to bring Ukrainian contemporary culture and deeper insight into the local context, into the focus of attention before, in 2022, the facilities of the cultural center were seized by the Russian army alongside with extensive destruction of the city in the, in the aftermath of uh, Russia's invasion. And uh, the organizers of uh, the space uh, became the displaced again. The activity of Platform 2 reflected a profoundly hybrid post-colonial situation in the region where the cultural environment was formed by the Soviet industrial landscape and the proximity of the Russian border. Therefore, its strategy was aimed at revitalizing 
uh, the artistic scene through reference to the existing cultural discourses, which could enter into dialogue with the audience's interpretations and expectations, addressing both the post-colonial condition and the, existen the existence of, uh, of all this cultural sphere in post-Soviet space. One of the events uh, held by the organization annually since 2016 was the so-called DECOM project, aiming at critical reconsideration of the Soviet legacy through art, which emerged as a reaction to the package of recommunization laws passed by the Ukrainian parliament in 2015. These laws presuppose the removal of Soviet symbols and monuments from public space and changes in the toponym. The decriminalization law sparked a discussion in Ukrainian society and were criticized somehow for their radicalism in terms of uh, uh, that some uh, part of Ukrainian society saw as vandalization of uh, the Soviet time heritage. Reflecting on this controversy, as the DECOM project stated that the decriminalization must begin from reflection and memory and not from oblivion and prohibitions. One of the exhibitions held in the framework of this program displayed the entanglement with the communist past and its traumatic and violent experience, exemplified by three plaster busts of Soviet leaders interconnected with red yarn, which also remarked on particular strengths of entanglement of the area in the recent past. Mariupol is one of the cities of the Donetsk region, heavily impacted by the industrialization of the Soviet times, particularly relied on the Soviet legacy as uh, the period when the city faced growth and expansion as an important industrial center. Consequently, the city's rootedness uh, in uh, the Soviet past, its Russophone population, and the nearby frontier with Russia, yet with a marked desire to stay within Ukrainian cultural reach, formed an ambivalent environment, which fully responded to Homi Baba's definition of post-colonial ambivalence. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the image to the right is, uh, from, from another project which reflects precisely on this process of uh, demolition of uh, monuments following the decommunization laws uh, in 2015. It's a project by Evgeny Nikiforov who traveled across the territory of Ukraine and he documented how actually uh, all these uh, Soviet time uh, monuments uh, were uh, demolished or modified in accordance to the, the, the vision of uh, uh, kind of, of all the struggle with uh, the Soviet uh, totalitarian symbols. The strategic borderline position of Platform 2 was the key to resistance to art with particular characteristics of cultural production on the front line. The organizations delving into ambivalence and representing a post-colonial perspective on cultural processes was important for their position at the intersection of cultural influences, where hybridity together with cultural syncretism was manifested at its full scale. Establishing a dialogue with the local community in these conditions was crucial for the post-colonial recombination and eventual slow decolonization of the region by step-by-step step introducing the topics of human rights, inclusivity, and art activism. The case of Platform 2 is exemplary of the idea that both post-coloniality and decoloniality can be constitutive forces behind the decolonization process, but in their respective slow and rated forms. Mm -hmm. And this is precisely the difference if you look at the, uh, at the period between 2014 and 2022 and uh, uh, for following to 2022. Uh, due to the loss of venue, uh, uh, we couldn't witness the, the colonial stage of activity of this organization unfolding in full. However, the activities of the organization's management, uh, like those of Ozelatia, turned to the documentation and memorialization of the war situation. The project by Platform 2 called Memoriupol uh, gathers an archive of memories about the city from its former inhabitants who survived the violence. Uh, okay, and uh, he, he, here I, I um, turn to other uh, case study of uh, organizations' uh, shelters, uh, which uh, accepted uh, and hosted uh, displaced artists after, after the outbreak of, of the full-scale invasion. Uh, the war affected artists as one of uh, the precarious groups. The importance of uh, grassroots initiatives in the decolonial processes is best demonstrated through the work of organizations which help to relieve the impact of the war and its adverse effects on the Ukrainian artistic community. The relocation of the activities from the places affected by the aggression was crucial for the support of artists at risk and at the same time helped revive local art scenes that hosted them. For example, the artistic residency Working Room, Robocha Kemnata, 
across five locations in the ivano frankivsk the Transcarpathian, and the Chernivtsi regions, hosted 17 artists since the beginning of the war. The residency is an initiative of the nonprofit organization Assortiment Nekimnata, Assortment Room, which focuses on the support of art that is currently on the periphery and defines decentralization of the cultural production as its main aim. This decentralization is key to overcoming the remnants of disintegrating cultural regionalism as the artificial discrepancy between the East and the West of the country, which uh, according to, uh, to, 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 to the historian uh, Andriy Partnov, who, who works in Germany, was pursued as early as during Leonid Kuchma's regime between 1994 and 2005. This regional gap led to the 2013-2014 confrontation when the vast pro-Russian disinformation campaign following Euromaidan proved to be partly successful and resulted in uh, the Russian occupation, as we know, the part of the country, including Donbass and Crimea. Under such circumstances, the exchange facilitated by Assortiment Nekimnata is crucial for adapting to the new wartime conditions, which require consolidation and collective resilience. And this consolidation, of course, needs to be rooted in, in, in the exchange. One of the participants of this residency, uh, sculptor Jana Kadyrova, presented the project uh, Palanitsa, which enters a dialogue with the theme of hunger, both inscribed into the traumatic memory of the 1932-33 Ukrainian famine and the recent events of the weeks-long Russian siege of Mariupol, preceding its destruction. This project reverses the vision of food as a source of life, and in particular of bread as a sign of hospitality, turning the latter into a means of resistance. The word Polynesia describes a type of Ukrainian bread, and uh, it has been reportedly used to reveal suspected, suspected uh, uh, Russian saboteurs in the spring of 2022, who were unable to pronounce this word co correctly. Moreover, anecdotal evidence proposes that due to some differences in Ukrainian and Russian phonetics, it has proven difficult for monolingual Russian speakers to spell the word in its conventional form. In Western Ukraine, where Kadyrova was in evacuation, she set a table replacing the bread with sliced river stones, as invitable and inedible as Ukrainian phonetics and Ukrainian territory are to the Russians. This project presents the decolonial gesture of inverting to the theme of hunger, turning it against the enemy who came to kill, and thus in breaking up with historical trauma, reinterpreting food as an instrument of resistance. And uh, kind of to remark, of course, this. Um, uh, this this project is uh, uh, is uh, kind of in in this reference to language is uh, focuses more on this aspect of uh, monolingualism and bilingualism rather than particular kind of language uh, uh, instructions. Uh, another work by the working room uh, resident Evgen Arlov reinterprets the historical legacy of the 1994 Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances. The artist borrows the title of the Budapest Gambit in chess and turns selected lines from the memorandum typed on paper into chess figures. In video documentation of the performance, the parties take turns reading lines from the memorandum, interchanging the order of the sentences, making it reminiscent of a theater play or a free verse poem. The unfolded papers cover the checks on the chessboard until no more space for movement is available. The Budapest Gambit is an art of setting a trap for the opponent uh, as an art of setting a trap for the opponent, is a metaphor for the legal breach in which Ukraine was involved with trusting the assurances of the agreement. But deconstructing the text of the memorandum, the artist intended to reflect on the absurdity of the game, where the rules are unclear and the narrative is not coherent, thus making space for a variety of interpretations and eventually leading to the violation of the agreement. Uh, and I would like to briefly mention another residency because uh, I, I think this is important uh, um, kind of for, for, for a full perspective on, on this topic is the art residency, which is called uh, Sorry No Rooms Are Available. And uh, it is based in Ushgarat, uh, the Transcarpathian region since 2016. Uh, the residency is based on the 1970s premises of the Interis Zakarpatia Hotel. And it similarly aims to support the decentralization of cultural development through art. Initially, the residency required its visitors to reflect on the local and regional characteristics of Ushgorod and the region. But after the outbreak of the full-scale invasion in 2022, the focus similarly changed to the projects reflecting on the war, violence, and the formation of historical memory. 
Even though, even though local practices cease to be the focus of the organization, the decolonial focus of this effort is expressed in rerouting the attention to local practices from other regions currently facing occupation and direct aggression. The residency developed a meaningful collaboration with displaced artists from the Kherson region, for example. The exhibition Resistance of the South, Diaries of Kherson and Odessa Artists by the residents uh, Yulia Manukyan and Sergei Dyachenko in March 2023 explore the reflections on the work produced by the artists from uh, these territories. The exhibition highlights the activity of the Museum of Contemporary Art of Kherson, an, an NGO based uh, on a private collection gathered by the artist Vyacheslav Mashnitsky, uh, which was uh, the result of initiative of a circle of artists in Kherson, who intended to resist the marginalization of contemporary art in the southern regions of Ukraine. Mashnitsky disappeared uh, in October 2022 in an occupied area of the Kherson region. And until now, his uh, uh, whereabouts are unknown. Uh, further affected by the unfolding uh, Russian occupation, witnessing the atrocities we are yet to discover in full, Kherson artists became refugees and challenged the traumatic narratives of the invasion of their hometown with their artistic uh, reflection on the violence they were both subject to and witnesses of. The collaboration between the residency and the representatives of the Kherson Museum fosters decentralization by centering the attention on yet another art scene that historically found itself on the periphery of art production, today actualized by the war. Moving the art production from the territories affected by the invasion prompted structural changes that allowed artists to act as conduits of their, of their experiences uh, and transmit this experience to the less affected areas. And fostered dialogue between regional art scenes that previously lacked communication with, with each other. At the same time, it prompted an epistemological shift which took place with the exchange of the experience of the war and its narration to the spaces less affected by it. As the organizations in the west of the country reflected on displacement, the internal hybridization of narratives encouraged further decentralization of artistic production, followed by decolonization of the structure with the constitution of a new knowledge. And uh, the, the, the last uh, focus of, of, my, of, of my presentation of today is the public institutions as agents of uh, decolonial transformation. And uh, I would like to say that uh, the effort of support of the artistic community during the war escalation was also carried by uh, several uh, charitable organizations, such as, for example, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, MOCA NGO. This nonprofit organization is uh, previously known for their proposal for the creation of the third public museum of contemporary art in Ukraine and uh, the organization of the relevant working group for this task. Uh, the development of which was uh, halted by the full scale invasion. And uh, they start uh, after the uh, beginning of the full scale invasion, they started gathering uh, uh, an archive of Ukraine's wartime art. So one of the events in collaboration with a uh, public museum, with uh, Museum of uh, Bogdan and Varvara Khanenka in Kiev, uh, which relies on the wartime war archives of, uh, of, of MOCA, is the exhibition Meanwhile in the Khanenka House uh, that uh, was ongoing uh, starting April 2023. Uh, the museum uh, holding the two richest collections in Ukraine, Western European art and Oriental art, had to evacuate this collection due to, due to the threat posed by Russian aggression. In April 2022, a missile fell in front of the museum, resulting in many broken windows, damages to the facade of this historical building, and a large pit in the place of a children's playground in front of the museum. So uh, in, 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 in the place of, uh, of uh, this evacuated collection, it was decided to make uh, an, an exhibition of uh, contemporary art. The exhibition at the museum aims to represent it as an empty space deprived of its exhibits and repurposed for the display of the temporary nature of the moment of danger, which affects its functioning in Garden National Heritage. Nine contemporary artists presented their site-specific works among empty frames and vacant display cases. Their projects largely addressed the wartime uh, uh, everyday living, focusing on the small scale stories of uh, individual everyday objects and people, people's lives behind them, in contrast to the permanence collection orientation on creating a long standing and aesthetically comprehensive narrative. 
For example, the installation Geographic Visions by Stanislav Turina presents a selection of eclectic objects from the artist's personal collection, including works made by his friends and other gifts, or such banal objects as shoes, uh, backpack, pieces of jewelry, among others. The installation addresses the geographic disparities linked to different places and times in wartime experience of distortion, when possibility of maintaining one's place and keeping up with some kind of structure of everyday life seems a task almost impossible. Another installation, uh, Keys from the City, by Dmitry Kazakov, is a collection uh, of the keys from houses of his friends who left them to the artist along with other personal uh, belongings when they either left the city fleeing the war or joined the army on the front line. This installation similarly comments on absences and gaps uh, as, uh, that provoked by the war, as the war disassembles peaceful life into uh, scattered elements. The exhibition examines how the war distorts artistic discourse and ruins its context, turning attention to small details which mark the necessity of survival rather than aesthetic appreciation. In the exhibition, the empty museum is presented as a known place, a transit transitory space which exists in the meantime of the war action. However, it is also the main artifact on display, as its emptiness documents the atrocity and trauma caused by the Russian war, and, the, and, uh, and uh, particularly emptiness uh, caused by the imminent threat on the cultural industry in Ukraine. The crucial elements of contemporary life uh, dispersed around exhibition uh, reflect on the decontextualization and devastation brought about by the war, its negative impact on the preservation of the past and the present, as well as the possibility of only preserving disrupted stories in times of distress and physical danger. The exhibition problematizes the main function of uh, the MOCA's war archive, bringing together these dispersed elements and turning them back into a coherent narrative, which would further form the knowledge-based foundation for Ukraine's decolonization efforts. And as, as the last example, <laughs> institutional transformations and wartime adjustments in Ukrainian public institutions, including the changes in the operations of one of the largest cultural spaces, the Mostetsky Arsenal. Since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, the Mostetsky Arsenal maintained active research and curatorial work on Ukrainian modern and contemporary art. The organization forms a strategy of exhibitions and display of modern and contemporary Ukrainian art being at the vanguard of comprehension and interpretation of Ukraine's transformation through art. Since the outbreak of Russia's war against Ukraine in 2014, the Mostetsky Arsenal has organized exhibitions which contribute to the epistemological shift fostered by both post-colonial reconfigurations in addressing the questions of historical memory and decolonial release through exploring and creating new narratives in Ukrainian contemporary history and directly challenging Russia's appropriation of contested art history in particular. Conceived and first presented uh, before the full-scale invasion, the exhibition by uh, Mostetsky Arsenal, uh, the, the, the exhibition by Mostetsky Arsenal, Futura Marinia, the Dreaming of the Future, which is currently on display at the Kumo Museum in Tallinn, in Estonia, focuses on the artists of Ukrainian futurism, as the vanguardist art movement that developed in Odessa, Kiev, Kherson, Mykolaiv, and Kharkiv in the 1910s, 1920s. Despite the exhibition's main focus on the social transformation and modernization of the period, its curatorial interest lies in highlighting lesser known histories of Ukrainian avant-garde as a decolonization of one more legacy that was disputed by Russia and Ukraine and the Soviet and Russia, Russian cultural domination identified uh, as the Soviet and Russian cultural domination identified Ukrainian artists as representatives of Russian avant-garde. The exhibition breaks up with this misattribution by bringing together works of artists who were either born or worked in Ukraine, such as Alexander Exter, David Burluk, uh, Alexander Bogomazov, uh, Viktor Palmov, Vasily Ermilov, um, among many others, from the collections of Ukrainian museums. By returning some of these names uh, to the national framework, the, this exhibition challenges the concept of, uh, the, of the Russian avant-garde as an umbrella old unifying notion and opposes Russia's cultural appropriation of the work by Ukrainian artists, together with claiming their belonging to the, uh, uh, and challenges uh, the, the, those claims of their belonging to the Russian cultural sphere. The focus of the exhibition also intersects uh, with the discussion that more frequently emerges in the public sphere. How to reconstruct Ukraine in the future after the war ends? 
The futurist utopian prospects, given the ongoing military aggression, echo the idea of dreaming of the future. The decolonial perspective contributes to this utopian vision as a futuristic insight into a new historical stage that would bring long sought disentanglement and break with the post Soviet space as a container for post colonial condition. Reclaiming agency in the production of new relevant knowledge as the key to reconstruction following the current anti colonial struggle. And to conclude, uh, I would like to, to say that uh, the changes in art institutions during the war had uh, both negative and positive effects on the development of decolonial culture in Ukraine. The negative effects consisted of the loss of cultural organizations and the displacement of artists and cultural activists. The positive effects included increased internal hybridity was the result of the exchange between regional art scenes and the simultaneous a significant uh, decrease in post-colonial hybridity as opposed to this internal hybridity. Ukrainian resistance to the cultural invasion has produced a profound impact on the cultural sector, leading to institutional transformation and fostering decolonization processes. Uh, this uh, period of uh, uh, rapid decolonization was forced by urgent and traumatic war conditions and was linked to a decolonial turn. The new strategies and ongoing uh, changes in Ukrainian institutions uh, rearranged the system to turning from reconsidering historically entangled narratives to overcoming the limitations of cultural regionalism by means of exchange and establishing a new epistemological basis as a result of decolonial cultural production. So, and uh, yes. Here I, here I will finish my presentation and thank you very much. I look forward to your comments and questions. <laughs> All right. So um, thank you so much. Uh, fascinating uh, material. Um, I'll invite people to submit questions either through the chat or um, in person, um, but maybe I'll lead off with a couple questions, one or two myself, uh, and we have about uh, 10, 15 minutes. Um, so I guess one question is, um, Kind of related to are these events do you see them as important primarily in and of themselves or you know, as expressions of the artistic community or do they also have broader relevance for um other communities in the public so for example how much public engagement is there of what these artists and artistic institutions are doing so for example um you know one of one of your um slides and your comments on it indicated that actual public attendance is quite low. Um, but is that the case everywhere, right, at museums? I mean, maybe people can't visit museums in wartime, um, but are students going there as part of field trips? Or is there media coverage of what these artists are doing? Um, are people following the artists more broadly in terms of like social media or, or some like, something like that that gives this you know, broader resonance um, in society? So I guess I'd just ask a little bit more. I'd be interested in, how this is contextualized, what you're saying in terms of uh, broader society and whether it's something that's just happening in the artistic community, or is it something that is um, being viewed and participated in by um, the broader elements of the broader society? Thank you for your question. Uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, these processes that are ongoing in Ukrainian uh, art, they are actually processes indicative of uh, kind of broader uh, shifts in Ukrainian society and the culture of Ukrainian society. And uh, that's why it is important to research them because uh, they art uh, has this capacity of uh, very exact uh, uh, reflection on uh, changing political and, and social situation. Also because uh, art can uh, conceptualize uh, some kind of complex uh, uh, questions into a simpler form to, to deliver it to, 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 to its public. Uh, so uh, for, for me, uh, I see uh, all this uh, in, in both levels, in the levels of, uh, kind of individual artistic production and uh, artistic institutions involved into this, I see uh, all these uh, processes of exchange, processes of uh, um, uh, how all this uh, narratives uh, they are kind of created and how how they are kind of reflecting on this wartime situation in, in different ways how, how, they, 
how, how actually they show the impact of this wartime situation on Ukrainian society as uh, this kind of the, the key notions to, uh, to, to, to address when we speak about uh, the colonial situation. So it's like uh, artistic production is like the top of the iceberg. And there is this uh, much well, kind of larger uh, social structure uh, below it. And in terms of audiences, uh, I would say that um, much of Ukrainian cultural production uh, uh, is uh, now ongoing outside Ukraine because of the obvious, um, for, for example, uh, when I spoke about uh, Platform 2, that all the organizers of this, uh, of this institution, they needed to, to flee and they, they are now in, in, in Europe. But uh, that doesn't uh, kind of uh, deny them the possibility of uh, active participation in uh, all this change that is ongoing in, in, in Ukrainian mm -hmm. culture. And it expands the dialogue, of course, and it expands, uh, expands the exchange, both local exchange inside of, uh, of, of the country that was uh, kind of exemplary, for example, with this uh, Western, uh, West Ukrainian uh, uh, residences that accept mm -hmm. uh, artists from, from the South and from, from the East. Uh, and also uh, kind of more like from 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 the international point mm -hmm. of view. So I would say that uh, uh, the main here is that these processes are representative of uh, of uh, kind of wider spectrum of cultural processes. And the second is uh, that uh, yes, uh, we see a larger presence of Ukrainian art than before uh, in. Uh, uh, process of, of discussion uh, and processes of uh, kind of uh, discussion uh, concerning uh, questions of decolonization, for mm -hmm. example, and uh, kind of louder voices of the artists in mm -hmm. discussing these topics. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, yes, please. Uh, I want to uh, start from something like very uh, general. Um, uh, so, first of all, um, uh, from what I uh, see in Ukraine now, not all people whom we are talking about, for example, this exhibition in Panenko Museum and like American phenomenon, they don't really use this term uh, decolonization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder why. Um, I guess uh, my understanding that, um, at least it's my explanation, I, I wonder if you agree with it, that um, they don't use it because uh, I guess it's such a um, uh, term that is so widely used uh, by the Western institutions, such a popular term in the West, uh, our world. Um, but at the same time, uh, although it has like this uh, very powerful political core uh, decolonization, it's like fighting against the oppression and the colonizer, at the same time, when we look at the um, how uh, in the uh, Western art institutions uh, it's used this decolonization lens, um, it's all you know like um, deprived of really like uh, political potential for any change. So it's like this white cube situation. We we just gather. Uh, 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 we like talk about art, and uh, basically we go home, and it's like and nothing changes. So I guess that's uh, my understanding why Ukrainian artists uh, are a little bit, you know, like skeptical to this term. I myself a little bit unsure if, uh, if like, if we use this term, we we don't really uh, follow the same kind of like um, uh, usage as it's used in the Western institution. And also, um, I wonder how do you see this kind of like. Um, uh, differences like uh, that has been uh, like the differences over time, for example, with Isolatia. Uh, because Isolatia itself was kind of like a colonial project uh, a little bit in terms of like that Luba uh, Mikhailova, uh, kind of like uh, Ukrainian oligarch, uh, a rich person who is uh, basically it's the, the smaller version of Pinchuk Art Center. So uh, you have money, uh, uh, you, you get this money through, you know, like uh, extracting resources from the region. You go to London, there you get this idea that, oh, like uh, oligarchs should have their own art centers. And uh, she created this art center uh, because she, like, basically, a lot of money. Uh, and 
you know when uh but uh, i guess it's not that i want to somehow diminish the uh the, the thing that uh, all people who work in the Zedatia, um uh, what, what people do there but i wonder how the institution itself um has been reconsidering its uh you know like its own history uh especially after they moved to Kiev. and how do you see like uh the difference between like what Zedatia has been doing in terms of like this um uh, it's uh, art project and for example uh the difference with uh platform q which is basically only like grassroots organization like people who don't have you know this kind of like financial backup of, of, of the like of the big uh, institution so that's my two questions so thank you for your questions Yes, the term, so the term of decolonization, I think I, I see two issues with it. Uh, first one is that it is um, much used in uh, some kind of public discourses without actual connection to some kind of theoretical uh, uh, basis of, 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 of this use, like without justification why the term of uh, decolonization needs to be used in particular case. And it's not just in the case of Ukraine, but uh, generally it's kind of a trending topic and uh, everybody tries to address this aspect of decolonization in, in some way. And in case of Ukraine, there is this particular uh, issue of um, uh, discrepancy between uh, theory and practice because uh, for example if you think about decolonial theory as uh, a theory that uh, is capable of uh, des describing this uh, de decolonization processes uh, and decolonial processes uh, we see that uh, decolonial theory is not fully applicable to ukrainian case because the colonial theory was formed in, in latin america and it, it reflects uh, in a way on the situation in particular situation of latin american countries with all this uh, uh, binary oppositions that they create and all this uh, situation of uh, kind of being on distance from uh, the former colonizer and uh, and it's not ukrainian case because there is there, there is a shared border and always there was this influences filtered through, through this border and in some way and uh, also, of course, it's kind of the global geopolitical picture is different, because if you think about uh, Latin American uh, decoloniality, if you think about uh, all this uh, anti-imperialist uh, discourse and uh, uh, the positioning of themselves on uh, kind of very particular positioning of themselves uh, sort of throughout uh, the, the Cold War, for example, while Ukraine was in the Second World and in, in, in the Soviet Union. So, uh, the, the, there is this very large discrepancy. That's why a new theory is needed, because neither uh, post-colonial uh, post -colonial theory nor uh, decolonial theory are applicable fully. Uh, and uh, from 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 the point of view of kind of more practical approach to decolonization, is um, uh, I think uh, this uh, in Ukraine particularly, this word has some kind of very uh, very strong connotations which are related to some particular uh, binary opposition some particular dichotomies that maybe are not a kind of shared in full by uh, many people in in, in in ukrainian society you know like this black and white uh, image of the world that's why uh, for example in my approach i, I speak about this internal hybridization and uh, with this emphasis on all this kind of uh, diversity and not even diversity because diversity you know is like different elements but more like something that is uh in in in, in resisting in permanent uh dialogue like uh like polyphony of of of, of, of different cultural influences and i think this is uh, kind of supporting that aspect is uh, an important part of uh the dec decolonization uh because uh changing the kind of the structure needs to be transformed uh because of all this uh, um, impact of, of the war and it needs to reflect on this impact but uh, the structure needs to be also sustainable in a way and in order to be sustainable it cannot base itself on only on, on on the position it needs to have some kind of wider fundament to, to, to support it and uh, i and but precisely the notion of decolonization uh uh, kind of leads to this kind of uh, this kind of of course is conditioned by this anti-colonial struggle that is ongoing this kind of extreme polarization and uh precisely uh this i think is something that subverts this notion because it leads to some kind of is exemplified by ukrainian uh, legislation 
for example, all these attempts to uh, and efforts to uh, decolonize through uh, some kind of legal uh, legal framework. Uh, for example, I think that uh, this latest changes to the to the laws on uh, decolonize, decolonization in Ukraine they are extremely superficial because they they focus just on on renaming uh, one. Uh, some places to other names and kind of was this fight, very superficial fight with all this uh, colonial symbolism, uh, like imperial symbols and so on. Uh, but I think that is why there is this uh, kind of those institutions that uh, they work towards uh, some change through uh, resistance mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. precisely in creation of uh, this uh, decolonial disentangled narratives, they don't uh, present themselves as uh, uh, those institutions working with the topic of decolonization because, uh, because of this kind of uh, particular uh, difference in, 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 in various approaches to, 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 to the topic. Uh, and about uh, the um, and the, the question of uh, isolation, I think we need uh, to look at uh, activities of institutions, whether they are grassroots institutions, or as you mentioned, uh, some institutions that had kind of some previous funding by the effects that they produce. And in case of isolation, we see that uh, actually they uh, fostered uh, in uh, being of uh, in the times of uh, their existence in, in, in the territory of Donetsk, they uh, fostered really this uh, cultural um, uh, ca 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 cultural development and cultural decentralization by bringing international artists, by making this dialogue, by bringing Ukrainian artists from different parts of Ukraine and kind of uh, revitalizing all, all this uh, re regional culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I, as I mentioned, uh, I think that uh, after the, they moved to Kiev, uh, they needed to change this um, this line uh, because, of course, the, the, the kind of this full connection with the region was lost. Uh, but uh, I th I think it is important actually that uh, they uh, refer to uh, kind of uh, to some documentation and uh, to this narratives that uh, they, they, are, they were created in, in, in the east of the country and uh, they are kind of bringing them to the center or centering them. And I think that's kind of their, their, their achievement in a way. Yes, but uh, of course, again, we don't see kind of uh, the world is uh, kind of black and white and this bi binary, bi mm -hmm. binary mm -hmm. opposition. So it's kind of, uh, of course, there is uh, some um, uh, so some kind of elements that uh, may be contradictory, but uh, I think we need to judge actually. Uh, well, even not to judge, because to analyze the situation by by the effects and the actual impact of of, of those activities. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, thank we've you. reached the end of our hour, but it's been a fascinating discussion, and I invite people to continue the discussion informally. Thanks, everyone online as well. And um, please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.